आई फॉर इज सेवेंटीन इंश्योरेंस कॉन्ट्रैक्ट इज नोन एज वन ऑफ द मोस्ट कॉम्प्लेक्स अकाउंटिंग स्टैंडर्ड बिकॉज इट डील्स विद फ्यूचर एंड अ लॉट ऑफ अनसर्टिनिटीज लेट मी सिंप्लीफाइड फॉर यू माई नेम इज मृतु सकायत रिप्रेजेंटिंग द आई क्यू स्कूल ऑफ फाइनेंस आई फॉर इज सेवेंटीन बिकम अफेक्टिव फॉर पीरियड कमेंसिंग ऑन और आफ्टर फर्स्ट जनवरी टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी थ्री दिस मीन दैट आई फॉर इज फोर इज नॉट यूज एनी मोर लेट्स एक्सप्लोर द स्पेसिफिक प्रोविजन ऑफ आई फॉर इज सेवेंटीन कवरिंग अ फ्यू की टॉपिक्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट्स स्टार्ट विद एन इंट्रोडक्शन टू आई फॉर इज सेवेंटीन दिस स्टैंडर्ड सेट आउट द गोल एक्सप्लेन द मेन टर्म्स and talks about the aggregation and separating component in the contract next i for 17 covers when to start accounting for an insurance contract in the accounts that's about the recognition then we have rules for measurement or the amount that should be recognized with respect to the insurance contract both initially when the contract first starts and subsequently in the subsequent reporting period i for 17 guides us in two major approaches general approach and premium allocation approach but of course we have also variable fee approach and modified general approach and others next i for 17 talks about modification and de recognition of insurance contract and finally i for 17 covers how insurance contract are presented and disclosed in the financial statement so that's a quick look at what is included in i for 17 now let's see to which type of contract we need to apply i for 17 it is for all insurance contract issued including reinsurance contract issued and also for reinsurance contract held think of reinsurance as insurance for insurance itself i for 17 is also applied for investment contract with discretionary participation features if the company also issues insurance contract it is important to remember that i for 17 is not just for insurance companies it is for any insurance contract additionally the standard outlines certain items that don't fall under its scope which you can view them on the screen so always check the standard for similar items and as you can see there are items that can potentially meet the definition of insurance contract but are actually excluded such as product warranties issued by the manufacturer dealer or retailer also let me point out that i for 17 does not apply to insurance contract held if you purchase an insurance policy pay the insurance free or insurance premium and gets the insurance coverage I for 17 does not apply to this. Now let's understand what is an insurance contract. According to the official definition, it is a contract under which one party that is insurer accepts significant insurance risk from another party that is policy holder by agreeing to compensate the policy holder if a specific uncertain future event or insured event adversely affect the policy holder. For example, consider the significant insurance risk to be a health emergency. and a person buy a health insurance policy to cover the medical expenses if that person then faces a serious health issue requiring expensive treatment the policy holder is compensated by the insurance company for the medical cost this scenario underscores that insurance is about managing the risk of uncertain future event rather than predicting event with certainty i for 17 provide detailed guidance on various aspect of the definition of insurance contract such as what constitute insurance risk and so on it is common for insurance contract to include additional elements beyond the core insurance coverage these extra element could be an embedded derivative an investment component or distinct goods or services the crucial point here is that if any of these three components are part of an insurance contract the entity must separate those component from the main insurance contract separate essentially mean that the separated component will be accounted for under a different accounting standard and not under i for 17 This requires us to exclude the cash flows associated with that component from the contract and the remaining contract will be accounted for under IFRS 17. The specific standard applied to the non insurance component depends on what component it is. Typically you would apply other IFRS 9 for financial instrument or IFRS 15 for revenue from contract with customers. Now let's delve into the grouping and aggregation. An insurer must define the level of aggregation of the insurance contract or how to group the insurance contract. Why is this important? It is because the insurer need to evaluate the insurance contract and their profitability at portfolio level and on the basis of group of contract and not on the basis of individual contract. This process can be broken down into three step. The first step occurs upon initial recognition where the insurer assigns an insurance contract to a specific portfolio of contract. A portfolio is essentially a larger grouping of contract that share similar risk and are managed together. For example, this could include different product lines such as portfolio for vehicle insurance contract, property insurance contract or life insurance contract. 
Following that, the step 2 involves dividing the portfolio into at least 3 groups as mandated by the minimum requirement of IFRS 17. These groups are organized as follow. Group 1 consists of contracts that are onerous or loss making at inception. Group 2 includes contracts that have no significant possibility of becoming onerous subsequent to their initial recognition. And group 3 encompasses all the remaining contracts. In the third step, it is necessary to form separate groups within the same portfolio at least annually, ensuring that the amount within the same group are no more than one year apart in terms of their inception date. This organization allows for a more detailed and accurate assessment of the contract's profitability and risk over time. This concept is fully illustrated in our complete IFRS 17 course, so you might want to check out for a deeper understanding. Now let's discuss the initial recognition of insurance contract. A group of insurance contracts should be recognized on the earliest of the three dates possible. First, the start of the coverage period, which is essentially the period during which the insurer is providing the insurance services. Next, it could be the date when the policyholder's payment is due. And if the contract does not specify such a date, it is when the first payment is actually received. And finally, for the group of owners contract, it is the date when that group becomes the owners or the loss making. It is important to remember that our discussion is about group of contract and not individual contract because I-47 focuses on groups. However, it is worth mentioning that the assessment for initial recognition is made individually for each contract within the group. Now let's discuss how to measure the group of insurance contract. When measuring group of insurance contract, there are several models to choose from and the primary model is general measurement model. This model is applicable to all insurance contract except for few exceptions that we will discuss. This model does not differentiate between the individual types and the duration of contract or between the short term, long term, life or non-life insurance. It applies uniformly to all insurance contract. The core principle of the general model is how it deals with the owner's insurance contract, which are those that are loss making or anticipated to generate loss right from their inception. I-47 mandates the immediate recognition of a loss for such contract in the profit and loss at the time of initial recognition. On the other hand, for insurance contract that are profit making or at least not loss making, I-47 does not allow for the immediate recognition of profit. Instead, such contract must initially be recognized at zero profit and any profit that arises over time as the contract perform is recognized gradually. This deferred profit is referred to as contractual service margin. I-47 also introduces some modification to the general model. First, there is simplified model known as premium allocation approach which can be used for insurance contract meeting certain criteria. I-47 also offers additional methods. For group of reinsurance contract held, the general model may be used with some modification or the premium allocation approach can be adapted as well. For insurance contract with direct participation feature, the variable fee approach is recommended. Meanwhile, investment contract with discretionary participation feature should also follow the general model even with certain modifications. This gives you a brief outline of the different methods for measuring insurance contract under IFRS 17. Now let's turn our attention to the fundamental components of the general model. The key question is what will appear on the statement of financial position in relation to the group of insurance contract. You will see a single figure representing either an insurance contract liability or in some cases an asset. That liability at any point in time is the aggregate of two components. Number one, the liability for remaining coverage and number two, the liability for incurred claims. Now the liability for remaining coverage itself breaks down into two parts. The first part is the fulfillment cash flows related to future services which includes all cash inflows and cash outflows associated with the group of contract. And the second part is the contractual service margin representing the profit the insurer expect to earn from this group of contract throughout their coverage period. Let me explain here that the liability for the remaining coverage relates to the future services. This means that the insurer needs to make a lot of estimates because the future is not known. On the other hand, liability for incurred claims relate to past services. This area is somewhat clearer for insurer since it is based on events that have already occurred and the insurer typically knows which insurance event happened and how much it would have to reimburse to the policyholder. To make this easier to understand, let's take a look at a simple timeline. Imagine there is an insurance contract that started on 1st January year 1 and will end on 31st December year 5 lasting 5 years. Now let's say we are preparing the financial statement as of 31st December year 2. 
This marks the end of the reporting period in our example. In this scenario, the period from the start of the contract until the reporting date is considered the past for which we have the data. Therefore, we will measure the liability for the incurred claims as a component in the measurement of our contract for this past period. And the second period, which runs from the end of the reporting date, that is 31st December year 2, until the contract conclusion in year 5 represents the future. Since we do not know exactly what claims will occur during this time, we can only make the estimates. This period is where our liability for the remaining coverage period comes into play as it covers potential future claims. And that's the very simple overview of general model. Now let's take a closer look to the liability for the remaining coverage because this is where the expertise of the actuaries is crucial. This liability is measured as the total of fulfillment cash flows and the contractual service margin. The fulfillment cash flows comprises estimate of future cash flows which are essentially projected cash inflows from the group of insurance contract. These inflows are positive aspect because they mainly represent the insurance premium received from the policy holders. On the flip side, there are estimated future cash outflows from the group of insurance contract. These outflows are considered a negative because cash has been spent. Here we are looking at expenses such as payment for insurance claim, servicing cost and similar items. Considering these cash flows occur in the future, it is important to account for the time value of the money. This means we need to discount those cash flows to their present value. Additionally, these cash flows need to be adjusted for non-financial risk, which is where the risk adjustments come into play. And it is typically accounted for as a deduction. The balance between these inflows and outflows is what forms the contractual service margin. Essentially, this margin represents the unearned profit from the group of insurance contract at the initial recognition. It is calculated as the negative value of the net fulfillment cash flows, meaning the total should net to zero for the contract that are considered profitable. This process ensures that the financial position initially reflect no profit for this contract in line with IFRS 17 principle of recognizing profit over the coverage period as the services is provided. In our comprehensive IFRS 17 course, we will delve deep into these concepts using many practical examples and Excel exercises. If you are looking to significantly enhance your understanding of IFRS 17, make sure to check it out. Alright, so far we have discussed the general model which is applicable to all insurance contracts with a few exceptions. Next up, we have a simplified model that is premium allocation approach. You can only use the simplified approach or the premium allocation approach for certain group of insurance contract that meets a specific criteria. This includes scenarios where the liability for remaining coverage under this simplified approach does not significantly differ from what it would be under the general model. To determine this, you need to perform a comparison test. Alternatively, this approach can be applied if the coverage period for all the contract within the group is one year or less. Indeed, opting for simplified model is a choice, not a mandatory. However, it is often advantageous to apply it because it simplifies the accounting process compared to the general model. Let's clarify a bit. Under the general model, you calculate the insurance contract liability by adding the liability for remaining coverage which refers to the future and the liability for the incurred claims. We have already learned about these components. Under the premium allocation approach, the process looks quite similar. You still calculate the insurance contract liability by combining the liability for remaining coverage and the liability for incurred claims. However, the key difference is that the liability for remaining coverage is calculated simply based on the unearned premium adjusted for few items without the detailed building blocks. This simplicity is what set it apart while the liability for the incurred claims remains the same as under the general model. For those interested in a specific numerical example of the premium allocation approach, our complete IFRS 17 course covers it in detail. Moving to the presentation, let's discuss how amount should be shown in the statement of financial position. You will see insurance contract asset and reinsurance contract asset listed separately, as well as insurance contract liabilities and reinsurance contract liabilities also separately. Unlike the previous standard IFRS 4, Asset and liabilities are not offset under IFRS 17, simplifying the presentation. In the statement of profit and loss, you must present insurance revenue, essentially premiums with some adjustment, and the insurance service expense such as claims and changes in fulfillment cash flows. The difference between the insurance service revenue and the service expense gives you the insurance service result. Then you address the insurance finance income and expenses, including the effect of changes in the time value of money. 
I for 17 simplifies the profit and loss presentation with just a few line items and requires extensive disclosure. This summary just scratches the surface of I for 17. If you are eager to dive deeper with numerical examples and a step by step solution, I encourage you to explore our complete I for 17 course featuring full video content on the standard. Thank you for watching and don't forget to follow and share this video if you found it helpful. Goodbye for now.